Hello everyone, I'm Lori with Behavior Education at Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary. Welcome to Serpente Sunday for August 29th, 2021. Today I have a question for you. Is all stress bad for your snake? What do you think? Well, stress is pressure. It's evolutionary pressure, it's physical pressure on our bodies, or it's psychological pressure on our mind. And without pressure, we wouldn't evolve we wouldn't learn and grow and become better than we are. Our bodies wouldn't get stronger than they are now. So if you haven't already figured out the answer to this question, it's yes. Some stress can be beneficial to your snake. Some stress is beneficial. Surprise. I guess I shouldn't have said that on the title slide because I gave this slide away. Now stress that challenges and can be overcome is beneficial for growth and development. It's beneficial for learning and for building resiliency. You might have heard the terms eustress and distress. And in the past, good and bad stress used to be referred to by these terms, eustress and distress. But the latest research in the last five years in regards to the psychology of stress and the neuroscience of stress talks about three kinds of stress. Good stress, tolerable stress, and toxic stress. We're going to talk about each of these, and I'm actually going to show you some examples. Well, I'm not going to show you an example of toxic stress. I don't want to see that. And hopefully you and none of your animals have ever experienced toxic stress, but everyone has probably experienced good stress and tolerable stress, and you're probably a better person because of it, and your snake or other animal is probably more resilient because of it. Let's talk about the good stress. That's what we all want to experience, right? And we want our animals to experience this as well. So good stress in your snake is going to be body language that you recognize in the green and yellow zone. They're comfortable and relaxed with the situation. And maybe they're stretched a little bit outside of their comfort zone, but it's still a situation that's manageable and that can even be exciting for them or have positive valence. And good stress, formerly known as eustress, is the type of stress experienced when things are challenging or exciting, but they're not distressing. It doesn't mean these experiences aren't difficult. It doesn't mean that things aren't hard, but they're manageable. And the stressful experience is beneficial because it facilitates learning, growth, and it helps build resiliency. This is John Shepard. He is a 2019 Morelia Bredley. He came from Ralph Polinski at Midwest Serpentarium. And on this particular evening, I was going to just feed him. I was going to feed him in his enclosure and I had opened the door. I was gonna do a short target training session where I just asked him to move a little bit within his enclosure. And when I came back, he was out of his enclosure. He was hanging out the door and he is at the top of his six foot stack there was nothing below him to exit onto, and he's never exited his enclosure voluntarily before. So I rolled up one of the activity stations just to see what he would do. I always look for these opportunities. If the snake is offering behavior, I'm going to give them an opportunity to show me what they're gonna do next if I progress that opportunity a little bit further by making it more challenging somehow or by just giving them additional opportunities. Like in this case, I rolled the activity stand up and he came out onto the activity station. It's six levels, including the top level and the bottom level. And it just took him a few minutes before he made it to the second level, which is just a little bit below his enclosure threshold, a few inches down. And I want you to really look at his body language here. It's relatively comfortable and relaxed. There's a little bit of tension in his body. He's slowly tongue flicking. He seems to be cautiously exploring this new environment that he has an opportunity to experience. There's two different textures on the branches here, one smooth and one rough. There's a rock down there. There's some fake foliage down there. There is a wooden dowel that's used as a perch. And more importantly, there are tons of other smells like dogs, cats, and other snakes that get around and use this activity station. And then he's seen the room at large, this whole big room he's now seen from a whole different perspective because he's on this activity stand. 
So after that, he makes it down to this uh, rock, and you can see that his body language has slowed down a little bit, but he still doesn't seem to be stretched too far out of his comfort zone. I don't think at this point he's stretched at all outside of his comfort zone. He's comfortable and relaxed, even though there's slight tension in his body, he's smelling that rock, he's still exploring, and he's curious. So let's look at what that situation was for Shepard. He was getting physical exercise, he was getting sensory stimulation for sure, with the sights and smells and different textures, and he was getting mental stimulation because he made the choice to come out of his enclosure, he made the choice to explore the activity stand, and he figured out how to get down from his enclosure to that second level. So learning was taking place. He was learning how to climb different objects. He was learning how to climb down. He was learning how to exit his enclosure. He was learning all sorts of things. And one of the things he was learning was trust. He was learning to trust himself that he would be able to accomplish these things that he was interested in investigating. He accomplished getting out of his enclosure and onto that activity stand and making it down to the second level. So he was learning to place trust in his own abilities. He was learning to trust the equipment that I provided for him, the activity station and the things on it. And he was learning to trust me because I was walking around the room this whole time. I was filming, I was moving around. He learned to trust that that activity was nothing he needed to worry about, that I wasn't going to hurt him. And all of that combined builds confidence in the snake. So he had an opportunity he exercised his agency and made a choice. And so the stress so far was exciting for him. It was interesting and it was challenging, but none of that was distressful to him. I would not categorize any of what he experienced as distressful. <clears throat> All right, so now he's made it down to the sixth level, which is that very bottom level. This is a few minutes later and he's made it down to the floor level. Now we live on a ranch and so we are always tracking in things on our boots and the animals are tracking things in from outside. So there's horse manure, there's hay, there is straw. Also we have wild mice that get in the house and their smells are on the floor. The smells from the dogs and cats are on the floor. And then anything any of us animals bring in from outside is going to be on that floor. And so he is smelling all of these things for the first time. And he's seen the room from the perspective of the floor level for the first time, because remember now his enclosure is a five by two by two black box cages enclosure, and it's at the top of a three enclosure stack. So he sees the room from a bird's eye view, not from the floor. Well, a few minutes later, uh, he, he actually didn't spend too long on the floor, and then this is what he does. He decides he is out. He sniffs around the floor a little bit, and then to me, it's like he's thinking, uh, I don't think so. Nope, I want to go back up. And he suddenly pulls himself back up, and this is when I observe a change in his body language, a change in his demeanor for sure. That was not comfortable and relaxed. That was body language telling me he made the decision. He didn't want any part of whatever was down on the floor and he was out of there. Now he has this dilemma. He's on the sixth level of this activity stand that's about five and a half or six feet high. He got down there during his curiosity, during his exploring, and now he needs to get back up. He's decided, based on his body language and his actions, that he wants to get back up to his enclosure, and now he has to figure out how to do that. Now remember, he's never done this before. So he's definitely made the decision, I don't wanna be on the ground. And this is different body language than we saw in the first set of videos. The body language in the first set of videos, he was comfortable, relaxed, moving slowly, tongue flicking slowly. Now he's a little more urgent in his movement. He's tongue flicking more quickly. He's moving faster. He's doing some approach and retreat around the environment that is surrounding him. And he's trying to figure out how he can get back up there. Now at this point, my husband said, why don't you just pick him up and put him back? Which I absolutely could have done, but that would not have helped him learn to be more resilient. It wouldn't have helped him complete this challenge on his own. It wouldn't have made him physically stronger. It wouldn't have made him mentally stronger. It wouldn't have given him this opportunity to problem solve 
and hit this challenge head on and and become successful at it. So this is making him work a little bit physically and mentally. It's challenging him and it's building confidence and resilience in this snake. So if I had just picked him up and helped him, it really wouldn't have been a help to him in the long run because he wouldn't have learned anything. He wouldn't have grown from this experience. So now he's made it up to the middle level. And so far in this last set of videos that we watched, I would definitely say he was stretched outside his comfort zone. He was exhibiting escape and avoidance behavior when he was at the bottom of the activity stand. He recoiled, he backed up, he lifted himself back up to that previous level. And then his behavior changed to something that was very much goal directed. You could tell that he wasn't just randomly exploring. He had transitioned from exploration to problem solving. He had a goal in mind and he was very task oriented. Now, how am I going to get back up to the top of this activity station? How do I get back to my enclosure? This is still good stress. Possibly you could argue that we're getting into the realm of tolerable stress, which I haven't talked about yet. We're going to talk about that. It may be somewhat distressing for him, maybe just a little bit. I don't think it was anywhere near approaching his threshold. I don't think it was anywhere near super distressing. It could have been a little bit distressing when he first got to the bottom, realized, hey, I want to go back up and I'm not sure how to do that. However, he was able to manage it and cope with it. And so this is still a beneficial experience for him. Now he's made it up to the middle level and he's made it up to this middle bank of cages. And what he has to figure out now and problem solve is how does he get up the next one or two levels so that he can reach his enclosure. Something else this is teaching him is how to differentiate these other enclosures from his. They all look similar. I'm sure they smell different because there are different snakes in each one. And that very bottom enclosure was actually open. The snake was out of it. He was engaged in a different exercise. So I've only got one little tab holding that door closed. So I'm sure that more scents are coming out of that enclosure than normal because the door is partially open. And here he's made it all the way to the top. The very top level is, is um, level number one. Um, the, the next one down, level number two, is the one with the branches and everything. And so he problem solved, he completed his task successfully, and he makes it back to his enclosure. Now look what he does. He doesn't go in his enclosure and hide. He doesn't go in his enclosure and go off to his favorite hiding spot and then I don't see him for days. He goes into his enclosure and before his body is even completely back in his enclosure, he comes back out. That's a sign to me that he's having positive valence with this experience, that it is not a bad experience for him. Yes, it was challenging, and the part where he was near the floor might have been just slightly distressing for him, but it also might have been interesting for him and exciting for him because look at what he does. He gets back to his habitat successfully, and he turns right around, and he comes back out, and he's surveying all that's below him. So he's gained confidence, he's built resilience, and he wasn't traumatized by this experience. So he spends a little more time on this second level and then he does decide to go back to his enclosure. And I didn't know if he would come back out again or if he was gonna stay in, but I thought it was important for you guys to see this part of the process. He came out of his enclosure for the very first time on his own, without me targeting him out, without me taking him out, without me doing anything to prompt him to come out. He came out on his own before there was even a stand there for him to exit out onto. And when I put the stand there, it's a stand he's seen before because I move it around the room, but it's not a stand he had ever been on before and interacted with before. He came out onto it, and not only did he interact with it right outside of his enclosure, he interacted with it all the way down to the bottom level, all the way to the floor. And then when he decided he had stretched himself a little too far and he wanted to go back, he problem solved how to get back up to his enclosure. But when he got back up there, he didn't go hide. He comes back out a couple of times, and then this last time he goes in 
and he's hanging out of his enclosure and we've come full circle because this is exactly how this whole experience started. All right, well, this overall experience was really fun for me to watch. It was about 40 minutes that this went on. He experienced physical exercise, mental stimulation, and this time in sort of the second half of this experience, his behavior went from exploring to goal-oriented, right? Once he reached the bottom and decided, I don't wanna be here, he had a goal now. It wasn't just, oh, I'm interested in exploring. No, I have a goal and he wanted to get back up to his enclosure. So now there was a task in front of him that he had to problem solve, but it was an achievable goal. I knew it was an achievable challenge that he could overcome and complete successfully. And that's why I didn't help him. I stood there the whole time in case he got into trouble, in case he needed help, but he didn't. He did it by himself. He achieved his goal, he made it back to his enclosure, and then he made the decision to come back out a couple of times and then finally put himself away. This absolutely built resiliency in this snake. And he was faced with adversity, he took action, and he successfully completed a task. So this overall experience was absolutely good stress for him. I'm sure he experienced excitement, cognitive growth, and it was just an incredible confidence building experience for this animal. I promised you that we would talk about tolerable stress and we're now past good stress. Good stress, remember, is challenging and can be difficult, but it's not distressful. Tolerable stress is challenging, it is difficult, and it is distressing. It's it's distressing, it's a bad experience. The experience typically has some type of negative valence to it, whether that's fear, whether it's anxiety, whether it's physical injury, whether you get startled, it's something bad happens and you are distressed. However, it's called tolerable stress because organisms can cope with it and return to normal with no lasting ill effects. So if you look up at my figures here, if we were referring to our body language chart with snakes and we were trying to assess body language to know if our snake was experiencing tolerable stress or good stress, tolerable, tolerable stress is gonna be all over the place. I actually think there needs to be a color between green and yellow and one between yellow and orange. So if you mix green and yellow, you get lime. And that's sort of that borderline mental state we saw Shepard in in the previous video, right? He was comfortable and relaxed. He wasn't like extremely stressed outside of his comfort zone, but he was a little bit stressed maybe to the start of his comfort zone when he got to the bottom of that activity stand. So he kind of vacillated between some green and yellow during parts of his adventure. But now what's this orange triangle? Well, if you get to the far side of yellow, you can get stretched to the limit of your comfort zone where you're about to reach threshold and enter the red zone where you're just over the top distressed. But you're not necessarily there and you can vacillate between yellow zone and red zone. And so if yellow and, ye yellow and red make orange, so I have this orange triangle here to indicate that when an organism is experiencing stress, you're gonna be all over the place up and down between one moment you might feel okay and then you're gonna feel anxious and distressed and then you might feel okay again. You might be stretched just a little bit outside of your comfort zone and then way outside of your comfort zone. So it's a dynamic experience. And what tolerable stress means is that the stress is challenging and it is distressing, but you can cope. It can still be beneficial because it fosters growth, learning, and it builds resilience for sure. Because when a snake encounters an experience that is distressing, but they cope with it well, and they're able to recover from it, they're gonna deal with similar experiences better the next time. So the stressful experience does cause temporary distress. It's short term. It's beneficial in the long term because animals learn to handle adversity they're able to recover from it. So that is what makes stress tolerable. It's distressing, but you're able to cope with it and you can recover from it. Your snake is able to cope with it and recover from it. This video that's been playing, if you watched uh, Super Dwarf Sunday last time, 
uh, TC went outside, or maybe this was in the last Serpente Sunday where I talked about snakes going outside. But TC was outside and he was having a relatively positive experience for most of his time outside. And then he suddenly becomes distressed. His body language here is distressed. He is stretched way outside of his comfort zone. He's entering the red zone. He's at threshold and he's looking for a place to hide from the heat. He typically does not like to burrow and get underneath things. So he got underneath this little platform, but that was distressing for him. He comes out the other side and he finds that some shade is there. So the platform in relation to where the sun was created some shade just on this side of the platform. And he finds a spot there where he's gonna sit in the shade. And you see that his body language starts to calm down. So he was absolutely distressed here. However, he coped with it. He recovered from it. And here he is the next day being TC. He didn't change his behavior the next day whatsoever. So he experienced distress, he coped with it, and he recovered from it. The very next day he wanted out of his enclosure and he got back in his favorite activity station where he always likes to sit. So he had no ill effects from that. And that is the definition of tolerable stress. He was distressed, he coped with it, he recovered from it. Everything was fine the next day, tolerable stress. Ah, this is a super ugly slide and I did this on purpose because toxic stress, the third kind of stress we're gonna talk about is ugly, it's horrible. We never wanna be there, we never want our snakes to be there, we never want any of our animals to be there. What defines toxic stress? The inability to cope, the inability to escape from the stressor, the stressor is not going away, and you're chronically over threshold in the red zone. So toxic stress is challenging, it is distressing, but organisms are not able to cope with it. If your snake is experiencing toxic stress, it is stress they are not able to cope with. That is the definition of toxic stress. So if the stress is really, 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 really bad, but they're still able to cope and recover, then it's tolerable stress, no matter how bad it seems. It's when they can't cope at all and they can't recover from it, that it is toxic. So toxic stress is an acute or chronic experience from which the snake cannot escape or which does not cease and from which the snake never fully recovers. So the stressful experience is something that the animal cannot cope with. Yes, I'm repeating this because it's really important to understand that this is what has to be the criteria for it to be called toxic stress. The animal cannot cope with it. They do not fully recover from it and it has lasting detrimental impact, lasting impact. So toxic stress is extremely bad. It can lead to increased fear, anxiety, distress, overall aggression, subjective helplessness, and poor mental and physical health forever in the long term. Uh, animals may be able to recover from this slightly, like they can get better than when it initially happened, but they never fully recover. And that's part of what makes it toxic. It's permanent. It has lasting permanent effects on the organism because they were not able to cope with it. Again, it doesn't matter how bad the experience seems. It might seem like the most horrible thing ever. If the snake is able to cope with it and fully recover with no lasting physical or mental um, side effects, then it's not toxic stress. It's tolerable. Whew. All right, I just thought we needed something pleasant after I talked about the horrid, horrible nature of toxic stress. So this is just a nice picture that I threw in here for all of us to be able to take a deep breath and see my beautiful Brazilian rainbow boa Rowena and my beautiful jungle carpet python Vedra. So the bottom line is that what is good for one individual may be tolerable for another. So I may think something's good stress, but another person might think, wow, I'm distressed by this, but it's tolerable. And then what's toxic for one individual could be tolerable for another. So one individual, whether it's a snake or a human or another animal, might experience something 
that they cannot cope with and they cannot recover from and it's toxic stress. But if a different snake experiences that same thing, they may be able to cope with it and recover from it. And so then it's tolerable stress. So like everything, this is very much on an individual level as to what is good, tolerable or toxic for each individual. When I was a young woman in my early 20s, I heard a quote and I, I actually am not sure if I read it or heard it, but it was that positive lessons are not always learned from positive experiences. In other words, sometimes negative experiences teach us positive lessons. And that's basically how I think of tolerable stress. So good stress is that stress that's exciting and challenging and hard, but it's exciting. Maybe we went on a hike, maybe we climbed a mountain, maybe we won the lottery, we got married, we sold our house, we bought a house, we bought a new car. Tolerable stress is we crashed our new car and it was horrible and we got injured and we were in the hospital and we think it's the most horrible thing that's ever happened, but we were able to cope with it and eventually recover with no long lasting emotional effects. But toxic stress is always bad. It's those experiences that cause physical changes to the brain's neurochemistry. It has detrimental long-term repercussions that are not completely reversible. If an organism experiences toxic stress, they cannot cope with it and they cannot recover from it. If you're interested in learning more about this, I have some references listed here and I hope that you'll take the time to look through some of these. I have some more detailed um, information about those plus one other reference on this slide. And I would really recommend that if this is a subject that interests you, that you look at these references. Um, they aren't just all about people. We learn about stress in people by studying animals first. And snakes are subject to the same stress effects as other reptiles and as mammals, all vertebrates have a similar brain structure, a similar neurochemistry, and a similar stress response. And so this information is highly beneficial if you're interested in learning more about how stress affects your snake or other animal or even people. And then Dr. Christina Spalding is somebody who I do a lot of my continuing education with. She is a neuropsychologist and she works with animals. She has a course coming up called Stress and the Animal in Front of You, the Impact of Stress on Behavior through the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. It is available for anyone if you want to attend. It's a four week course and I have the link to that here or you can just go to the IAABC's website and look under courses or Dr. Christina Spalding's website and she lists all the courses that she teaches. I want to thank you for listening and learning today. Just as a reminder, the snake body language chart is available on the home page of my website, behavioreducation.org. I want you to think about the fact that green, yellow, and red are just generalities. They're guidelines for us to keep in mind to help us better assess how our snake's feeling at any given time so that we know when to allow them to continue an activity and when we need to maybe put them away or leave them alone and back off. And I think that it isn't so cut and dried with the lines in between and that there are some areas between green and yellow and some areas between yellow and red where the animal is maybe on that threshold of I'm not quite there in that next zone yet or maybe I'm straddling both zones a little bit. And so let me know what you think about that. Always be kind and love your animals. That's really important for me. And when I say always be kind, I don't just mean to your animals. I just mean always be kind, be a kind person to everyone that we interact with, but especially to animals and love your animals. If you have any questions, please contact me. You can reach me at behavioreducationllc at gmail.com or via my website or on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, or Twitter. And until next time, love your animals, always be kind and continue to learn. Make sure that you're experiencing challenges and good stress and maybe just a little bit of tolerable stress for you and your snake, but please don't push yourself or your snake into situations where the stress becomes toxic.